I'm going to use some slides, which I hope will just help get some of the points across. So I'm just going to share my screen. So if you just bear with me a moment while I get that set up, that would be really helpful. Um, OK, I'm assuming everybody can uh, see that now. Uh, the slide with the, just the title slide at the moment. Um, so uh, what I'm going to try and do is cover three things. Uh, what is organising and why organising at work is particularly important. Uh, a bit about choosing organising issues and a specific bit about striking for climate, which obviously before COVID, uh, we had the rising movement inspired by the school strikers uh, that was encouraging a lot of people in workplaces to think about striking for climate as well and hopefully that will spark some discussion clearly in the, the time we've got we can't dig deep into the kind of how how of organizing at work but hopefully uh, it will get some good discussion going uh, anyway so first of all what is organizing um the point of the slide really is that there are a huge range of different views about what organizing is there's the dictionary ones i've put there but amongst activists it gets used, it's quite a fashionable word at the moment, so it gets used to just mean any old campaigning, really, um, or arranging things or getting people to do things, anything like that. But I want to focus more on the points towards the end of those split points about building organisation and building power, which I think are, are more at the heart of organising or what some people call deep organising. So you might have heard of a, uh, an activist and writer uh, an organiser, Jane McAlevey from the US, has written some fantastic books about uh, her experiences organising, but also uh, uh, lots of case studies of other people's successes and failures as well. Uh, she makes a really helpful distinction between mobilising and organising. So mobilising is being about finding the people who agree with you over whatever the issue is and using uh, you know, good skills and techniques to turn out those people uh, to have as much impact as possible and clearly mobilizing is important without that we don't get uh, don't get results but she argues that organizing is different in that it's building power it's winning over new people uh, and therefore has the potential to build big majorities who can take high stakes action like strikes so mobilization is the effective use of people already on our side organizing is going a bit um, uh, a bit beyond that uh, I should say there's more to her distinction than that, but that's the kind of headline, I suppose. And then why is work an important uh, site to think about organising? I mean, obviously, the main reason people organise at work is to improve their life at work. And if you want to get your employers to do something, organising work at work is the obvious way to do it. But I think if we're thinking um, as people who want to see radical action over the climate crisis, we ought to think a little bit wider about why uh, organising work is important. I would argue there's something specific about the employment relationship that generates conflict. It's not just about bad managers or evil bosses or things like that. It's something structural. The fact that when you have an employment contract, it can tell you what time to be there and how long to be there and a few other things, but fundamentally, it can't control the quality and quantity of work you do while you're there. And that's why you have management who are trying to get as much out of you for as little as possible uh, while you're in work. And that generates constant conflict, whether workplaces are organised or not organised. There's always a bit of pushing boundaries uh, on both sides uh, over what, what, the, what the deal really is uh, when you're at work. I think there's the issue that work is nearly always collective. Um, and I think that's true even when work is remote, which has obviously been much more of a, uh, an issue uh, during COVID. But that's nothing new. I mean, when uh, the railways were first introduced, um, you know, the idea that you would have a train driver who couldn't be supervised was a really radical thing. People thought that they would just stop the train uh, initially. And then when they got the idea that they would still drive the train, uh, there was the idea, well, how could you possibly organise them when they're all on their own? Uh, signal workers similarly typically working alone so isolated working is nothing new but there's still a collective effort in almost all work in order to get get things done so I, i've got the figures here from 2015 i'm sure there's some more up-to-date ones but i don't think it's changed that much 61 percent of uk employees 
worked for an enterprise with 150 or more employees. So that's quite a big uh, outfit. And 85% worked for an organization with 10 or more employees. So this myth of the kind of one or two worker being the norm uh, is grossly exaggerated. It's taken by looking at the statistics backwards about how many of these tiny companies there are. And there's loads and loads and loads of them, but they just don't employ anywhere near as many people as the, um, as the bigger ones. So there's a collectivity about work uh, in the way that the employer organises work that then turns into a collectivity in our organising in response. Um, another key distinction that Jane McAlevey has popularised is the idea between structure-based organising, where you identify everybody employed by a particular uh, company or living in a particular housing estate or um, tenant of a particular landlord, whatever it might be, um, and you try to organise everybody in that structure. Uh, and she contrasts that with what she calls self-selecting organising, which is the type of thing I'm sure most of us have done at one time or another, where you might stand on a street corner with a stall or some leaflets, uh, you hand things out or you post something on the internet, uh, and the people who agree with you uh, come and join and get involved. They take a leaflet or they come to the demonstration or whatever. And she argues that structure-based organising is qualitatively different in that you have the much more potential to win over new people because you're talking to everybody and therefore the potential within that structure to build big majorities who are capable of taking powerful action and it's obvious i think if you think about it if you had a thousand people scattered across every you know city town and village in, a, in an area uh, you know one in each they would have much less power than that same thousand people if they were the workforce in a single uh, single workplace capable of acting in a collective way. Historically, workplace organisation has been very resistant to repression. An example I always think about is in apartheid South Africa. There were a number of states of emergency, absolutely brutal repression against the organising in the townships. And yet during those states of emergency, union organisation of black South Africans continued to grow because it was much harder to use repression. You couldn't drive um, armoured vehicles through workplaces without trashing uh, what the employer wanted as well as the workers uh, themselves. And then probably most importantly, there's the potential power of organising at work, the potential impact on profits, on services and on society. And I would argue that because of that, organising at work could, doesn't necessarily, but could provide the power for wider social and climate justice uh, fights. So a little bit more about potential power. Uh, McAlevey defines power as the ability to get what you want and stop, stop that uh, which you don't, which I think is quite a nice down to earth way of um, thinking about it. But we need to distinguish between potential power and actual power. So as an example, uh, when I, I used to work in the IT industry, as, uh, as Pete mentioned, um, and many workers in that industry believed they didn't have much power. And before we were having our first national strike in the company I worked for, uh, we had a kind of training course for some of the activists and we had one of the stewards from the Grangemouth oil refinery um, there. And he made a comment. He said, well, it was easy for us. We had an oil refinery to play with. And we all knew what he meant. Uh, he meant that the power that they had, the potential power was obvious that they could stop fuel supplies to a large part of Scotland. But we had quite a discussion about that and we talked about supermarket checkout workers. Well, actually, they've got millions of pounds worth of perishable goods passing in front of them every day. Do they not have huge potential power? They do. But in order for that to be real power, they have to be aware of it, which is much less likely in the case of those workers than in the case of all refinery workers. They need the organisation to wield that power to be able to act together in a collective way. And they also need the politics, they need the will to do it. So there's a very uh, strong current in trade unionism towards partnership, which is the idea that, you know, you do best if your boss does best, uh, rather than actually uh, a struggle. Um, so you need politics where you're prepared to use that power. It's also worth recognising that not all workers have the same potential power. It's not true that the type of power that a checkout worker or an oil refinery worker has is the same. Some have more power because of their location in production or the economy, what's often called structural power. Some people have skills that are easier to replace uh, than others. Some people have, are more dependent on the job. If you live in a 
society where people have allotments and a good welfare state and people have savings and all those kind of things, people can sustain themselves through struggle uh, much more easily. So they have more power. There's associational power, not just through the unions, but uh, political parties, campaigns, community organisations and so on. And we could also think about institutional power and the types of power that different types of workers have shape what tactics and strategies of struggle uh, make sense for those groups of workers. So that's all I want to say really about um, what organising is and why workplace organising is important. But uh, I want to move on to uh, some stuff about choosing issues to organise around. I think the first thing to say is that there are lots of issues we should act on, but they're not always necessarily good issues to organise around. So if you're a trade unionist, you might, you know, a union rep, you might find yourself representing somebody in a disciplinary where, or a grievance where the information about what's going on is really personal to them. They don't want to make it public. How can you organise easily around that? Um, but you still, it still might be the right thing to do to do some campaigning or work around the, around the even if you can't organise around it. So a, a good yardstick for choosing organising issues are ones that are widely felt. It's not just felt by one or two people. It's deeply felt, so it's more than people just moaning by the coffee machine. It's uh, people actually feeling strongly enough that they're willing to do something about it. Uh, it's visible, and this is one people often don't think about. So sometimes you can win something and then it's forgotten a few days later. Um, other times you can win something and people are kind of reminded by their daily life about that win. And I'll give two examples of that. You think about when the pensioners won free bus passes. Now you imagine the government that tries to take those free bus passes off pensioners, right? Every time somebody gets on a bus, they're going to be reminded of who did that to them. Um, so I, th I think there's, there's uh, quite good examples of that. Another one I, I heard of in, in the US, some of the nurses won control over the, setting their own shift patterns um, as long as they you know, met cover requirements. Obviously, if that's taken away from them, uh, you know, they're going to know that every time they get given a shift that doesn't suit them. So that makes a big difference to how useful an issue is for organising. And the last one, and probably the most contentious one, is, is winnable. Uh, so you want to pick issues that you can win over uh, for organising purposes. Again, it's not to say you don't have to do things about issues which aren't winnable. Sometimes they're points of principle, but those are good ones to organise around. And I would argue that they're mainly, but not exclusively, going to be workplace issues. And it's worth saying that this is quite highly gendered. If you ask workers what their most important issues are, men are much more likely to focus on narrow economic workplace issues than women who are more likely to cite issues around housing or health or education or um, other um, social issues. And you can use surveys to find or test potentially or potential organising issues. A bit more on what is winnable. I think there's been a huge temptation, a huge mistake uh, in a lot of unions to aim really low, uh, to think, well, we're weak and therefore we'll aim at trying to increase the pay offer from 0.5% to 0.55%. Well, clearly you're not going to motivate anybody to turn up a meeting, never mind take any action for the sake of uh, a microscopic uh, change to a, to a pay offer. It has to be worth fighting for. And one way around th of thinking of this is that there's this organising cycle of finding issues, organising around it, educating people about it, taking action over it, and so on. And you can repeatedly go around that, starting maybe with easier to win issues, building up power uh, on the way to, to doing bigger ones. So even if you've identified your big issue you want to win on is uh, something really major, that doesn't mean you shouldn't pick off smaller issues on the way, but you want workers to understand that, that is what, that's what the smaller issue is. It's a stepping stone, uh, not, not just an end in itself. And to win, you have to be able to credibly threaten a disruption cost uh, to the decision maker uh, that's greater than the concession cost. And I just want to unpick that a little bit. So concession cost is how much would it cost them to give you what you want? And that's not just money. That could be about what precedent does it set? What does it do to their reputation? Does it conflict with their values? Uh, all those kinds of um, uh, kinds of issues. And the disruption cost, uh, there's important words there, credible threat. So once you've done the disruption, if you've done something, you can't threaten it anymore. And the employer can't avoid, the decision maker can't avoid uh, that cost. They've already incurred it. So there's no benefit to them in making the concession if there's no future um, cost threatened. 
credible threat is also really important. You can threaten anything you like, but if the decision makers don't believe that you have the capacity and the will to carry it out, uh, it's not a it's not a, a threat that will get results. And so it's really common for people to use escalating action where they take some action to demonstrate their capacity to take more action. Um, so it's worth thinking about that when you're thinking about what, what demands are, uh, are winnable. So I want to move on uh, to talk specifically about striking for the climate, because in Britain we have a problem, and in most countries we have similar problems, that the anti-union laws here make political strikes unlawful. And I want to just highlight a distinction here. Unlawful means not authorised by law. They're not explicitly permitted by the legislation. They're not, despite the fact people often use this word, illegal, which means banned by law. Um, but they, they aim to stop them anyway. That's the, um, that's the key point. So there are three routes that I can see uh, to workplace strikes for climate in Britain. There's unlawful strikes. There's ones that are outside the legislation. The safety walkouts and uh, people will remember, I'm sure, the, um, uh, uh, the action by the NEU Education Union um, uh, in particular, but other, other unions as well, um, using Section 44 over COVID to try to uh, uh, prevent unsafe working. And then in some circumstances, you could have official lawful strikes. And there's a link there to a guide I've written that goes into this in, in more detail, those different avenues. But I'm just going to take a few minutes to go through each of those in turn. So firstly, unlawful strikes. So this is any strike that hasn't jumped through all the horrible legal hoops of the anti-union legislation. Typically, unions won't back uh, uh, these strikes because if they do, they risk getting injunctions, unlimited fines and having their assets seized. And the older among you, I'm sure, will remember this happening. Uh, a number of times through the 1980s. So they're usually unofficial as well as un unlawful in that, uh, that the union doesn't back them. The impact of doing this is that strikers have got no legal protection against dismissal, uh, which to be fair was the case for everybody before the Employment Rights Act 1990. So employers could dismiss every striker um, anyway before that with no legal, uh, legal recourse. People have to rely on numbers, solidarity, and uh, reputation, um, uh, reputation damage in order to um, uh, 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 prevent, protect themselves. And it's worth saying these strikes happen all the time, particularly in industries like engineering construction, where work is so volatile, it's almost impossible to go through the cumbersome uh, process to strike uh, lawfully. And generally speaking, if people stick together, uh, they avoid all these horrible uh, consequences. Specifically over climate, it's worth bearing in mind there's a lot of reputational pressure on employers not to dismiss climate strikers. And when we had the, the biggest attempt at workplace um, uh, climate strikes was 20th of September 2019. Quite a number of workers uh, demanded uh, advanced commitments from employers to not have any sanctions against anybody who did strike. And that process of doing petitions and leafleting and campaigning uh, to demand no sanctions in itself built up the, uh, the climate strikes. In some cases, people did win that um, uh, commitment from employers, and that obviously enabled far larger number of people, uh, larger numbers of people, to be confident uh, to participate. And similarly, official days of action, even if they don't involve the unions calling strikes, uh, like the 20th of September, can help build support and solidarity um, beyond that. So. There's room for us to take uh, uh, and organise unlawful strikes around climate. Uh, sorry, I've skipped the wrong way. Uh, secondly, safety walkouts. Um, uh, a, a little bit more to say about that. Um, uh, one of the problems with the legislation is that the action has to be individual to be protected. Um, so if the union organises people to walk out together, um, there is a risk still of sanction from the employer. And unfortunately, people are more familiar with that now, employers are more familiar with that now since the uh, uh, COVID cases. I know when I've organised safety walkouts at my old work, uh, the employer didn't have a clue uh, and we got away with it. We didn't get any pay docked. Even. So, um, you know, that, that works. But I suspect many will be a bit sharper on that now. Uh, it's crucial to notice that the employee be re 
reasonable belief of serious and imminent danger that's the test. The employer can disagree all they like, but that's the test. Does the employee reasonably believe there is serious and imminent danger? But because of those words, serious and imminent, it's unlikely that it will be protected to uh, use safety walkouts directly for climate. But there could be opportunities to uh, use it indirectly. So, for example, there was a large crowd that was a bit unruly outside your workplace. Uh, you might feel that it wasn't safe for you to attempt to enter um, uh, that workplace. And, you know, these kind of tactics have been used. I mean, um, uh, I've been involved on Manchester based. Uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, community uh, protests uh, outside some of the SCAB bus depots during the recent Go Northwest bus strike uh, that blockaded those bus depots. Um, and prevented, uh, prevented vehicles, uh, vehicles leaving. So th there's opportunities there, particularly if workers inside are sympathetic uh, to use protests as a, uh, as a justification for, for refusal to, to work. Uh, finally, um, there's the question of official lawful strikes. So these are called by a union after going through this complex uh, ballot process, which typically takes at least five weeks, often much, much longer. Uh, the union doesn't have to have union recognition, and this is one of the reasons why some of the very small unions like UVW manage to call, organise very quick ballots. They'll uh, argue for a strike amongst workforce, get quite a small number of people to join the union, ballot those people, and then they can call the whole workforce out on strike uh, lawfully. Much harder if you've got a, a, a large uh, membership and you don't know who's a member and who's not, and the details aren't, aren't up to date. Doing this route gives strikers and the union some legal protection, but such strikes can only be uh, in relation to a trade dispute between workers and their own employer, which make obviously a huge barrier to uh, striking over climate. And, and you must have tried to raise the issue and resolve the dispute with the employer first. So I want to just dig in a little bit more to what a trade dispute is. So it's defined by the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act. Uh, and you can see there the different uh, categories of issue which could uh, make a lawful uh, trade dispute. Um, so some of them clearly not relevant, some of them maybe could be. Um, so I've done some work and picked up ideas from wherever I can to try and come up with a list of ideas of things that might uh, qualify as a trade dispute for the purpose of calling action but which are climate related. Um, and you can see there's quite a lot of different ones there, ranging from uh, issues around things like air quality uh, to a lot of travel related things, work allocation, hiring, you know, hiring extra staff, uh, travel facilities, canteen provision, uh, what vehicles people are using, uh, child care, uh, union facilities, temperature. Uh, and, and the one at the bottom, I think, has become a lot more relevant since I first wrote this uh, um, uh, the, the guide that this is drawn from uh, support like paid time off and rehousing uh, for workers made homeless or unable to work by climate events and I'd included uh, epidemics um, uh, in that um, and, and I think it's easy to imagine that you could have uh, issues in a workplace around any one of those or any combination of those maybe include them with some other issues which are more traditional uh, and end up in a position where you could have a lawful uh, a lawful dispute. So uh, I'm going to end it there. Hopefully that's been food for some uh, discussion and uh, look forward to what you've all got to say.